Um, welcome everybody. I'm Andy Miller. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems, and um, I organize our department seminar series. So before we get started, I'm just going to show you what's coming up uh, next week um, and the second couple of weeks. It's not showing up on screen. Oh, you know why? Should I stop sharing? Um, actually, I think I can just. You got it. Well, that's not what I want. Okay. Oh. Can you see this list? Yeah. Okay. So this is today's seminar. We're going to hear all about that in a moment. Next Wednesday, our own Dr. Chris Swan will be uh, giving a talk. Uh, it'll be over in the biology department, room 004, that is co-sponsored with our Department of Biology, Biological Sciences. And then the week after Thanksgiving, obviously we're not gonna have a seminar on the week of Thanksgiving, on Wednesday before Thanksgiving. We have our guest star two poster session and lightning talks. And then there's an afternoon, um, there's an afternoon human context of science and technology and social sciences forum talk that we are co-sponsoring. And then the final uh, seminar of the semester will be with Dr. Anastasia Romanu from the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, talking about marine heat waves, a growing problem. So with that, I'm gonna um, stop sharing screen and I'm going to invite uh, Rhonda Plufkin to introduce our speaker and then he will go ahead and take it away. And uh, Jamon, you can go ahead and, and start sharing your slides. So All right, thanks. Rhonda's uh, introducing you. Hello, uh, thank you, Dr. Van Den Hoek, for coming and speaking to us today. Um, Dr. Jamin Van De Hoek is an associate professor of geography at Oregon State University, where he leads the Conflict Ecology Lab and works at the intersection of humanitarian and conflict research, land cover, land use change, and geospatial sciences. He uses satellite imagery and a variety of geospatial data sets to monitor damage to cities and landscapes caused by armed conflict develop new approaches to map refugee movements and refugee environment relationships, and assesses long-term environmental and climatic changes in politically fragile contexts around the world. Jamin was a NASA postdoctoral fellow at Goddard Space Flight Center and completed his PhD in geography at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thanks. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yes. Good to go. All right. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I have a bit of a cough, so apologies if I'm going to be. <clears throat> I may need to cough here and there, but I'll make through it. Um, so my talk today is called expanding the humanitarian horizon. Um, this talk is. Basically comes out of about a decade of work on this. Topic of bringing together environmental data, um, mainly remote sensing data. Um, humanitarian science, particularly focused on refugee camps, um, as well as IDP camps, um, and really trying to think about what we can do when we try to leverage the best of what remote sensing Earth observation offers. Um, so by way of background, um, I think of most of you in this room are probably geographers too. I'm a geographer. Um, I'm really trying to take what geographers think about, so sort of place-based, space-based relationships, human environment relationships, and think about these in the context of humanitarian settings, both in the short term around environmental conditions and longer term uh, climate change. Now, this is where the sort of um, maybe change in orientation happens when we start thinking often about uh, humanitarian spaces compared to other research spaces or study spaces. Um, humanitarian events are often very uh, data scarce and processes. They're data scarce and they're ephemeral. So they, uh, we often uh, just don't have the kind of data we want to work with or we could work with in other scenarios. Um, there's also often uh, challenges of access, right? Um, there are sometimes literally humanitarian blockades where just no one is in and out, is in or out. Um, that makes it really tough to do the kind of traditional research where you could um, do participatory mapping or collect interview data. Uh, it also really uh, speaks to the benefit of taking um, uh, learning from remote processes or remote uh, modes of data collection like satellite image uh, analysis. Now, 
Though these events and processes are data scarce and ephemeral, they do leave marks on built up and natural uh, landscapes. These, in many cases, are uh, quite strong. They can be detected. They also are long lasting and they tell us a lot about um, what uh, the, these relationships are in an armed conflict setting. Um, like what we're doing, monitoring the war in Gaza right now, we're seeing the result of uh, bombardment. We're seeing urban damage across Gaza. In other cases, in say in a refugee setting, these kind of uh, landscape signatures would be perhaps associated with agricultural access or cultivation by refugees or new settlements that are established around refugees, uh, around refugee settlements. Um, to basically respond to the market needs of that new incoming population. I'll talk more about this in, um, in my presentation today. Um, all of the, the, I have three different case studies here um, that are really trying to think about how we can expand the temporal and spatial extent of how we understand these relationships. So I'm, I refer to this as expanding the horizon. We wanna think over longer timescales. We wanna think over broader geographies and I think that'll help us also think uh, across different themes and ask different questions than we typically would otherwise. So by way of background, um, refugee, uh, global refugee population currently stands at about 35 million people across 132 of the world's 195 countries. This is truly a global phenomenon. Um, here we have a color coding of different types of refugee settlements planned um, which would be those sites that, say, the UN agency in charge of refugees, the UNHCR, would be there in advance of refugees arriving and establish a site, clear land, prepare it basically for arrival, build dwellings, right, build roads. Um, we also have the green triangles, which would be spontaneous or unplanned. Um, this is the bulk of uh, refugee settlements, uh, 7,000. Um, these would be sites where we have um, a collection of um, uh, people coming, a group of, of people coming into a site, and this is sort of the, the typical notion of a camp that is just established. People rest there uh, in a place that's perceived as being safe as they're fleeing from violence, and that place builds over time. Um, this is also has a lot of similarities with uh, inform informality or informal settlements. Um, whether those are favelas or slums, these are in some cases, in some ways, similar processes of just like urbanization, informal urbanization. Um, then we have a, a much smaller group here, which is dispersed locations, um, where we have a don't really have a centrality to the collection. So these are actually very difficult sites to study because they are just quite literally so dispersed. Uh, we don't really understand where it begins and ends. Um, so the term refugee is a legal term. Um, it refers to international migrants. You have to cross a border to be a refugee um, who have been forcibly displaced, um, but they've been granted protection under international law. So um, I'm sure you're all aware of, of some of these very large scale uh, refugee exoduses, Syria, um, the Syrian civil war led to, uh, this is uh, an estimate, but approximately 6.5 million refugees today who are mainly in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, um, or South Sudan, uh, where we saw 2.3 million refugees going into Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya. Um, there's also a lot of refugees in Ukraine, um, but there are no uh, Ukrainian refugee camps. So this is quite a distinct process. Or ref there are refugees from Ukraine, but there are no refugee camps for Ukrainians in the same manner that we would see, say, for, for um, Syrian or South Sudanese refugees, um, the vast majority of uh, Ukrainians who have left um, are integrated into urban areas. They've been received into existing cities or villages. So it's a, that's a different uh, kind of uh, process than what I can study uh, with remote sensing. There's no new settlement established, for example. Um, most refugees, when they seek asylum when they which is a, a term for uh, this formal protection abroad uh, they go just to the neighboring country um, not always the closest country but usually um, a bordering country so when the uh, refugee movement 
um, is underway and once the refugee settlement establishment is underway, um, there is a lot of emphasis on collecting data, um, not only at the personal level or the household level of, of actually documenting the refugee, uh, the families, the names, um, the demographic uh, uh, statistics. These are sort of the, the core uh, data sets. Uh, there's a quite a formal registration process that in, is involved here. Um, but there's also increasingly um, much more use of geospatial data to understand uh, to mark the locations that that say a camp is being established at. These data tend to be collected really early on in the very, very beginning of uh, refugee camp establishment. And I would argue not so much after that. So there's a lot of data in these first couple of months and then that sort of attention to the foundational data sort of fades away because other humanitarian concerns um, tend to focus uh, shift to say education, uh, to health, to um, infrastructure, to electricity, to uh, water and sanitation, right? The, these very pressing humanitarian concerns, that's where the attention goes, um, understandably. Um, but meanwhile, we sort of stop paying attention um, from from uh, new data collection around uh, landscape dynamics, geospatial data um, that could tell us about refugee environment relationships, uh, refugee food security relationships as well. These don't tend to be collected that much. And this process is very fast. Um, as you can see in this time uh, time lapse animation from Sentinel two, um, right in the middle of 2016, you'll see this refugee settlement, which is um, Pajrin in northern Uganda is established uh, in a couple of frames, really, of this animation. So there's the skeletal road uh, network, here come all the dwellings, and the camp is established. So this is about a three to five month period, um, this camp, which eventually hosts, um, I wanna say this was about 60,000 people, um, is established, quite rapid. Refugee camps, uh, highly varied. Um, completely conform to the local context and environment. So uh, a Rohingya refugee camp in Bangladesh right here, we would see uh, very evident it's very hilly. Um, it's a very uh, dramatic terrain in terms of profile. Um, we also see it's it was broadly vegetated before these dwellings um, uh, were established. Um, and there's very widespread terracing across uh, this this settlement, this would be Cox's Bazaar or Kutu Palong. It's known a couple of different ways. Um, this is markedly different from Syrian camp in Jordan, for example. This is Zatari, um, which looks like a um, planned city, doesn't it? Um, grids, straight lines. Uh, it's very flat. It's also extremely arid. Um, these are just um, both high population refugee camps. The Kutu Palong camp happens to be the largest population of refugee in the world, but these are uh, both uh, better studied camps compared to others, um, but uh, incredibly different. And from a remote sensing perspective, um, these just, you can't, you're not even going to be asking probably the same questions, right, at these, at these different kind of, at these different places. Um, there's no, not uh, much vegetation in the Syrian context. There's uh, abundant uh, vegetation clearing in the Bangladesh uh, Rohingya refugee context. Here, the real concern is uh, water security. It's ensuring aid um, when, uh, it's, sorry, it's ensuring um, that people have um, fresh water to drink when they need it. So they truck in um, bottled water uh, by the thousands every day. Um, in Bangladesh, um, it rains quite a bit. Um, so uh, having fresh water isn't perhaps as much of a concern um, but landslides, erosion, and um, there's even instances of human wildlife conflict, human elephant conflict that are have been really pressing concerns. Um, so just very different, uh, you know, needs and issues to to, to tend to. Um, layout, obviously, I mentioned this before, but we have a grid set up on the left and and very sort of organic, um, irregular in a sense on the right with uh, the terrace landscape. So I think we can all agree that there is there would be benefit um, from geospatial and earth observation data to monitor these 
environmental and climatic changes in refugee settings. But what if we think about the very foundational data to begin with? Just where are camps? Um, well, UNHCR hosts refugee camp location data. These would be essential, right? If we want to do, say, a global or, or a continent-wide assessment, we want high confidence, high precision locational data. Um, we looked at 2,000 refugee settlement locations publicly hosted by UNHCR. Um, and we use this tool that some of you may may um, have already used, the Collector of Online, a really excellent tool that's uh, typically used for um, doing visual interpretation of of some kind of satellite imagery um, for uh, collecting training or validation data for something like an image classification, land cover classification. Um, so we found um, that about nine percent nine percent of sites we could see them. We get a latitude longitude. That's the blue dot. Uh, there underneath the E um, on the left hand uh, slide, a left hand uh, snapshot. Um, that, that's the latitude longitude location given by UNHCR. And sure enough, look, there's a settlement right there. That's great. That's what we like everywhere, right? 9% of, but only 9% of sites offer that. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, 10% of sites, um, we just couldn't see really any evidence of human occupation, which is to say dwellings or obvious. Um, sort of localized land use changes um, within three kilometers. Couldn't see anything. Um, the rest of the sites were sort of in the middle there, right? So 52% of sites uh, were within three kilometers of at least one visible settlement. We don't know if that's a refugee camp, if that's the refugee camp, um, but at least it's close to uh, another settlement. And then 28% um, were just enmeshed by an urban area uh, with quite unclear geoprecision when they're just surrounded by urban settings. We just don't know where it begins or ends. So it's a little difficult to, to make use of those data in this way. Um, right now, we're working to um, prepare a global database of refugee settlement location, boundary, and associated metadata, um, or ancillary data, I should say, such as population, nationality, establishment timing, um, to really try to improve the baseline of a geospatial database so that um, other researchers don't have to slog through this like we've had to for so many years, um, where this database should uh, provide awareness of uncertainty of the locations, which locations we have confidence in, which we don't, where we have uh, boundaries associated with them, uh, for example, not just a centroid, but a boundary, in which cases uh, we don't. And then the various kind of metadata that would be, I keep saying metadata, ancillary data that would be extracted at that centroid or at that boundary uh, that could go into um, some kind of, say, econometric modeling um, for as covariates, could go into um, so, uh, efforts to understand population dynamics um, at this uh, site or, or environment relationships. Um, so we're just sort of building up an agnostic database that we hope can be used in a bunch of different ways, and we should have um, uh, that in the next couple of months, we hope to, to submit that work. Um, so we also looked at that, that, la that last section of slides was looking at just locational geoprecision, really quality. Um, what about how well um, leading uh, remote sensing human settlement products do at capturing refugee settlements? So a lot of these um, uh, settlement data sets promise high accuracy, say 80, 85, 90% uh, settlements like, uh, sorry, products like the global human settlement layer, the high resolution settlement layer, the world settlement footprint. Um, that accuracy is great, but um, refugee settings are challenging in a bunch of ways. And, they're, and they, uh, of, uh, of course, were not included in the validation uh, exercise to assess the quality of, of these products. So we did that um, at 30 refugee settlements across Uganda. We looked at um, those settlement, those products that I list there. We looked across 30 different uh, settlements across Uganda where we have accurate uh, information on boundaries, on uh, pretty good data on um, on building footprint locations, um, we know when these sites were established, so we can actually gauge, you know, uh, whether a given product would have been able to capture the refugee settlement 
or at what stage it captured the refugee settlement, say the data were from 2018 or 2019, that's relevant. We need to know if the camp was fully formed or still growing. So we looked at, at these different products and, and um, basically saw how well they could do. Um, on the right, you see a, a graphic showing the output or the results. Um, pink, um, or maybe it's coming through as magenta on the screen, um, would be hits. So these are places where we see agreement between the product and our, our reference building footprints. Um, gray would be misses, um, and teal would be false positives, where the product says there's uh, human settlement present, but uh, we don't have any evidence of that. Um, overall, these don't do too well. Um, most refugee settlements had median detection below 50%. Um, we thought that the earliest, the longest standing, the largest, the densest camps, um, that's collectively uh, Chiangwali or Achinga and Rhino camp. Um, these are big and old, relatively speaking. Um, we thought those that these products would would do well at capturing uh, the conditions in those camps, but um, not so much really. Actually, they were uh, not necessarily any better. They tended to be at the lower end of the detection rates. Um, you can see if these st statistics are helpful, the probability of detection, um, F1 score or critical success in index or a false alarm rate. Uh, some of the, the um, accuracy metrics commonly used in machine learning analysis. Um, you can see that, uh, for example, if you can see my, my mouse here, the grid three um, product here uh, does really good at probability of detection, um, but it also has the highest uh, false alarm rate. It is extremely high false alarm rate. Um, in fact, it, it um, makes it really difficult to use grid three with uh, something like this because it just sees settlement everywhere, right? It just overpopulates um, the landscape. And so you'll, where there is actually settlement, you've got it, but you also have it in all these other places. Um, and the most of these just, just have uh, middling to, to low value. Um, now this is worrisome because um, these data, human settlement products are some of the core data that go into a ton of other follow-on analyses. So population modeling, um, that's perhaps the most uh, important of these where we have to know where people are living first. And then if we have census data, we try to say disaggregate the data um, at that local level. This would be uh, efforts from say the world pop team at University of Southampton. Um, if we don't know where people are living in the first place though, it doesn't matter how good your algorithm is. We just don't have that, that spatial we don't have those pixels to populate, right? We just don't have it. And, and that's where this is very concerning that uh, not only is the product not accurate, right? We just are giving a misrepresentation of, of the actual um, population density in refugee camps, for example, with these derived follow-on products. Um, it, it also just further marginalizes, further diminishes the presence of refugees who broadly are already excluded from all sorts of SDG monitoring interventions, disaster risk reduction frameworks, uh, kind of you name it, the national census itself, uh, refugees tend to be excluded from that. Um, so this is a sort of a worrisome um, finding. Some good notes though, um, in the past couple of years since we uh, completed that study, we've seen this growth of uh, rapid improvement in detection at refugee settlements. Uh, here's the difference um, uh, from World Settlement Footprint 2015 based on Landsat 30 meter data to World Settlement Footprint 2019 based on Sentinel-1 and 2 data at 10 meter resolution. <clears throat> Market improvement, much better uh, at detecting refugee settlements. Um, I'm gonna skip that for now. We're, we've been working with uh, the GHSL team, Global Human Settlement Layer team to um, conduct an updated assessment across uh, all refugee camps around the world. And we um, summarize the, the stats here. This is the uh, different products on the left there, on the left-hand column. These are all these various um, human settlement footprints. Um, and we break this down by region, Eastern and Southern Af uh, Asia, Northern Africa and Western Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, et cetera. And then we, we check the total uh, average accuracy 
a lot of improvement, but I hate to say it's still not great. Um, the average of accuracy across all of these settings is um, about 32%, um, but very pleased that there's awareness on this and moving towards improving um, the detection of these um, often small scale, often uh, diffuse uh, human settlements where we have, you know, these highly vulnerable marginalized populations that are uh, just often left out from these uh, core geospatial data sets. So we've, we've got some some progress in this direction. Um, so what about how camps change over time? Um, can we use satellite time series detection approaches to better document um, changes in refugee settlements? Here we're borrowing from landscape disturbance um, theory, which uh, this is a graphic from the land trender uh, work by Robert Kennedy et al, which is um, they're really gone in all sorts of different directions. Um, uh, this sort of thinks about disturbance as um, a state change or a condition change. Um, a state change would be this, um, the, the most typical scenario would be just have basically falling off a cliff. Some spectral metric like NDVI, the normalized difference vegetation index, would be more or less stable up until the time or have some trend, um, but then, ooh, it plummets. So we see this dramatic drop in NDVI at some date. If we're in a refugee settlement context, that would be the conversion from natural vegetation to say a road or a dwelling. Um, that's what a, a state change would be. Um, condition change might be more of a long-term process and gradual. This could be uh, because of sensor, sensor resolution limitations, this could be the gradual build, uh, establishment of say built up materials um, within a broadly vegetated ma landscape, but we're seeing this sort of gradual uh, uh, growth of uh, human settlement presence. And so that when we're looking at say a 30 meter pixel that just chips away at the NDVI over a long period, we don't tend to see uh, this third example of disturbance followed by recovery much um, because recovery doesn't happen so much in refugee settings, right? Once camps are established, they, uh, they tend to stick around for a very, very long time. Um, so I mentioned Landsat, I'm sorry, I mentioned Land Trender. These are graphics from Land Trender, but we uh, worked with, um, uh, this is a couple of years ago when we did this, we probably do it differently now, but when we ran it, uh, we worked with uh, the BFAST algorithm, which is the breaks for additive seasonal and trend disturbance detection algorithm. Um, it looks at long-term trends as well as seasonal trends. <clears throat> um, if we look at how BFAST works, um, Similar algorithms, say like CCDC or cold, um, they would work with a, a similar kind of setup where you basically uh, look at a long record of uh, data points, some spectrometric or some collection of spectrometrics. Here we're just looking at NDVI, um, and we fit a curve, fit a harmonic um, to that uh, data set. And the way BFAST works is we we tell it uh, the monitoring period, and then we also look for the uh, sorry we look for the historical period, and then we look for the monitoring period. So in the case of our refugee settlement detection work, we know when these sites were established. So we're not um, we don't need to you know guess necessarily. Um, we don't try to find the settlement establishment, but we want to be able to uh, track pixel by pixel at the ability of the sensor to to identify when. A, particular pixel did convert, um, did show uh, land change. So we start monitoring um, in 2016, which is a little bit before um, six or seven months before the camp is established. Um, we established this historical record, which is the blue line here. And then the algorithm tries to push that cycle forward um, pass uh, into our monitoring period, past the, the um, uh, the opening of the, uh, the camp date in 2016, and at a date when the residual is so great that the um, collection of data points, it just deviates so far from what we expect to see then, it, there's a threshold that you set, and then we call it when basically it's deviated so far, it's clear, the algorithm says that it's clear, um, that we're no longer following the trajectory that it had been on. At that date, we call that a breakpoint, and we flag that. That's what this dashed red line is. And so this uh, plot here is from this red dot, which is uh, right here in sort of the center of the settlement. 
Um, it's a large, uh, it's a area that was converted from natural gra from natural grassland to uh, built up structures and quite large built up structures at that. So it's a pretty profound signal, pretty profound break. Um, by comparison, if we look at this other patch here uh, outside of the camp, sort of as a counterfactual, this yellow uh, dot site, natural vegetation before, natural vegetation after, uh, we don't detect a break point. It just basically stays stable the whole time. We don't see a deviation. So um, what's nice about this and other kind of disturbance detection algorithms is while you have this um, profile per pixel, you can also make um, maps, right? You can map the date at which you see this disturbance taking place. Um, and that's what we see here. Um, from and we see most of it in 2016. You can see some of the um, infrastructure as well as some of the, the dwellings have established. This is where we were with that large building, the red dot in the last slide. Um, and then some of this transitions over into 2017 as well. Um, this tends to be outside of sort of the core urbanized area. Um, and that uh, we identify that as broadly being associated with agricultural growth. So it's not, um, it's still vegetation, but it's a completely different cycle, right? Completely different um, phenology, uh, different seasonal trends, different uh, amplitudes, different uh, uh, frequency of, of the vegetative signal. Um, and that got flagged as a breakpoint when we just changed those, those basically those harmonics. Um, so we know that that um, by comparing to other data, that area tends to be agriculture. Um, we can even plot this then uh, month by month and sort of look at the cumulative buildup of the settlement uh, month by month and associate that land cover change with different uh, land uses. So whether it's new roads and structures, infrastructure or dwellings or uh, cropland farming, uh, we, can, we can plot that month by month. We did this study, um, I think in 20, maybe 2020, 2021, um, but what it, you know, had we done this at the same kind of dynamically in real time as the settlement was being established, uh, we would have had these data available right then. Um, we in fact didn't have any open street map data, one of the leading open uh, data repositories until uh, about two years later. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of value for doing this in real time. And indeed that's what we're, we're trying to do in other uh, cases now. Um, we've looked also at, um, changes in, um, economic conditions or proxies for economic conditions in refugee camps using similar time series approaches, but with nighttime lights data. Um, also in Uganda, we looked at, um, Bitty Bitty refugee settlement on the left, Rhino camp on the right. These are the 2 very largest settlements in Uganda. Um, Uganda had a. COVID era lockdown where refugees uh, basically were not permitted to leave uh, the refugee camp for extended period. And that led to this question of um, and concern also because there are also food security drops, there are electrical uh, uh, shortages that were reported. Uh, there was a concern that <coughs> refugees were really um, being I further isolated during this, this COVID time. Um, so we looked at these 2 settlements, we tracked nighttime lights in these 2 areas and these 2 camps, and we compared the trends that we saw in refugee camps to nearby, uh, to, to areas within the camps that were refugee, uh, uh, settled areas to non refugee settled areas, what we call host areas. And we see that, uh, those differences um, plotted here, we have orange trajectories where uh, the host communities have a uh, fairly high, relatively high nighttime lights trends uh, compared to the refugee community in purple. So leading up until the start of lockdown in early uh, 2020, um, already host communities have higher nighttime lights trends, which is a common proxy for socioeconomic productivity. Um, once the start of lockdown occurred, both refugees and hosts dropped. Um, 
and they stayed low, but refugees dropped um, and then continued to decline. Um, and then at the end of lockdown, they both uh, ramped back up, but refugee uh, host ramped up a little bit more quickly uh, than uh, than refugees did in Bidi Bidi. We see a similar uh, story in um, Rhino. Um, this, to our knowledge, is some of the first um, work where we're actually trying to, where we're, we're able to make use of nighttime lights to study some of these socioeconomic uh, conditions in refugee settings during uh, this COVID era, which is just broadly data scarce, right? Anecdotal. Um, so this work is in preparation right now, um, but we're we're really uh, interested in taking these methods further into other uh, cases where we can actually make use of nighttime lights data. Um, let me shift gears a little bit away from sort of the environment um, and sort of uh, uh, economic conditions, land use relationships to think about more sort of external exogenous uh, uh, factors such as uh, global climate change. Um, a paper from a few years ago, um, Shugadal linked there at the bottom, um, commonly referred to as the climate niche paper, put out this proposition of basically looking at historical uh, climate niches that go back to basically the beginning of, of uh, modern civilizations um, and found that broadly human beings live, have lived in a very narrow range of climatic conditions. They took that range and they compared it to where we see um, climate conditions going throughout the end of the 21st century. And we see, um, and they compared where we think we'll be at the end of the 21st century compared to where we are now and, and basically have been for uh, since the beginning of human time. Um, and they made this map here, which uh, plots the suitability change. Um, this is very concerning because, as you can see, these dark red areas um, and orange, these tend to be some of the most uh, densely populated refugee settings here. Um, South Asia, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa and East Africa, <coughs> we know are also just uh, separate from the suitability analysis, going to be some of the hottest places on earth to live. Um, and they also tend to have a lot of refugees today. Um, this is worrisome, not only on its face, but also because the UNHCR doesn't have any uh, policy or any, any levers to really deal with climate risks right now. There's uh, only brief mention of climate risk in the uh, campsite planning minimum standards documentation, and there's just bare minimum standards for climate and environmental exposure assessment. Uh, sorry, and there's, there's minimum and minimum standards for climate and environmental exposure assessments have yet to be adopted. Um, so they're a bit flying blind, as it were, um, going into uh, what we see is uh, rapidly accelerating uh, climate change in uh, refugee hosting areas. Again, um, everyone in the world is affected by climate change, um, but refugees and other socioeconomically marginalized populations just have far fewer resources to adapt to it. So we're not just trying to, we're not saying refugees are more exposed, but what we're saying is the combination of extreme, or the worry is the combination of extreme exposure with very few means of a recourse, such as leaving a refugee camp, just migrating, refugees often don't have that, that uh, not even a luxury, they don't have that right to leave. Um, so this, that concern motivated um, this paper we, we published last year. I have uh, links at the end of the presentation on all these papers, but um, we wanted to take stock. We wanted to think about um, what is the actual sort of marginality, what is the difference in terms of exposure between refugee camps and non-refugee camps? Um, we looked at the case study or case study region of East Africa, where we uh, have a lot of refugee camps. We also have a lot of high quality geospatial data. Um, and we also have sort of a, a, a similar climatic conditions in a fairly general sense um, across the region in a way that, for example, if we compared South Asia to East Africa, very, very different, right? Climatic conditions. So we didn't uh, we didn't broach that. We um, tried to have this sort of regional approach. Um, we identified um, hazards such as floods, drought, extreme heat, and landslides. Uh, we brought together eleven satellite-based remote sensing products, um, 
And we looked at how uh, and we put those together into an index, um, which was the an exposure index. Um, this is all detailed in the paper. Um, and we looked at how these different camps, which are shown in red, basically compare to other um, uh, settlements around them in border regions, um, because border regions are, are where refugee camps tend to be. Um, so we looked at this across um, our East African study camps. We found um, that most camps tend to cluster around sort of the, the middle of the exposure. Uh, broadly speaking, we didn't see evidence that camps were uh, necessarily um, predominantly more exposed than non-refugee settings. Um, Kakuma, which is a very large camp in Kenya, that's the only camp that got close to the top quartile, didn't even get in the top, top quartile, but at 70th percent, um, it is definitely more relatively um, exposed compared to other regions and the other uh, uh, sites within its its region. Um, and it also happens to be home to the fourth largest refugee population in the world. So we have an extremely dense refugee population that has relatively high exposure. Um, six other refugee camps are in that second highest quartile. Um, and then uh, collectively, if we look at those, uh, Kakuma plus those six other camps, that tallies to about a million, uh, sorry, uh, 677,000 uh, uh, refugees that are in that sort of upper echelon of exposure, um, which accounts for about 41% of our total refugee population. But the story here is not that we're not seeing um, refugee camps seeing uh, extremely great exposure compared to other sites. We're seeing much more middling exposure. In some cases, we're seeing much less exposure. So if you look at Tanzania, look at Ethiopia, even some Uganda, like this is a good thing. Uh, we're not seeing them predominantly um, overexposed. Doesn't mean that there's not a worry, um, but it, it also doesn't, it's not necessarily an alarm bell um, compared to some of, I would say, some of the rhetoric around um, extreme uh, climatic impacts in refugee camps. We're not really seeing that yet broadly, and um, we certainly don't really see that broadly speaking in our in our study. So in the last couple of minutes here, um, I just wanted to think about or raise the question of how can we start addressing these intersections between uh, today's refugees, um, migration, and climate change, sort of these three factors that we're touching on in that last study. If we look at the Global Compact on Refugees, if we look at the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, or the UNF C, the Convention on Climate Change, none of these address climate change effects on current refugees. It's just an outside topic. It's not grappled with. Um, in separate work, we proposed a justice-based fra justice framework to guide the relocation of overly exposed refugee camps. Um, there's no specific camp in mind here, but we're thinking about uh, maybe not 2050, but 2250, 2350, right? As climate change accelerates, um, this seems to be an inevitable concern um, that these decisions will have to be made, and we are woefully unprepared right now to deal with this. Uh, the refugee, the the concerns around refugee settlement to begin with, are highly political, highly fraught. Um, there's a lot of uh, economic concerns that are really legitimate. There's a lot of extreme xenophobia um, that affects placement of refugees, sort of the um, out of sight, out of mind mentality. So we have to grapple with this um, because the world's wars continue to make refugees, and it seems like refugee uh, populations are only going to increase. At least they haven't. Uh, we we've only seen increases, I think, since uh, uh, for the last eight years. Every year we get a larger population. So. Um, we have to start grappling with this, and we propose this justice-based framework to do that, which takes stock of um, distributive, procedural, and restorative justice um, principles, which recognize refugee and host communities being similarly exposed and basically having um, not placing the burden on refugees, not placing the burden 
on host communities either, promoting uh, discussion, dialogue, collaboration, building of trust, social inclusiveness. Um, these are some of the principles that, that we're proposing in this, uh, in this framework. Um, one of the main things that I think is coming out of this work is <clears throat> just to recognize the core foundational value of, um, of migration, the core uh, in, inherent ability just to leave a place that you deem unsafe, which is what refugees did in the first place, leaving a conflict setting, uh, once they're in a camp, they do not have that uh, option to leave if they see climate, if they deem climate risk as being um, uh, too too much of a risk, right? Um, that needs to change. The restrictions on voluntary migration of refugees for camps, that's detrimental to the climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. Um, we need to start working on climate relocation and identifying uh, camps that uh, we need to basically start laying the groundwork so we can perhaps anticipate some of these challenges down the road and start preparing for them sooner than later. Um, and we need to, uh, as best we can, recognize the human rights and dig dignity of refugees as well as hosts um, so that this can be done in a just and equitable way for everyone. Thanks so much for your attention and happy to take some questions. Thanks, Jim. I'm very interesting and provocative. Uh, I, I posted a note on the chat asking people if they have questions um, to either raise their hands or just post the chat if they'd like to ask a question, and we'll just have you unmute and ask your question. So, who would like to go first? All right, I don't see any hands raised yet, so I'm going to. Yes. Oh wait, Matt, does that is that your hand? I can't tell. Use the WebEx hand. It's like yeah, it's a little tiny hand. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see it. Okay, I I wasn't look. I don't. I wasn't looking at the pictures. Go ahead. All right. I always annoyed online. It's so hard to clap. So I'm just gonna clap for you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Matt. Um, I really enjoyed that. I liked seeing the tools that I use used for much more useful things. Um, and uh, I had a question for you about. I have a nerdy question and a broader question. So let me ask my nerdy question yeah. first. Um, a lot of those global sediment layers were done using deep learning on high resolution imagery, right? So it seems like you've pointed out they're not performing very well, partly because the, the thing they're looking at keeps changing um, and it's quite variable. And you're finding that land trender and works better, which is actually an argument I've been having with a colleague on a NASA grant for a while now, that hmm. we need to map uh, informal roads using both. And are you aware of any approaches that have tried to say take um, over time, CCCC land trader inputs and put them into a deep learning framework to try to see if you can see some sort of hybrid that works better than some of its parts. Hmm. I haven't yet. You know, I think the um, where the deep learning. So I guess to to put it more broadly, too, like the um, dynamic world product, and there's a recent one that came out with Planet Scope data. I don't recall. Uh, so three meter, you know, like daily. Uh, land cover maps. Those are, uh, and and the global human settlement layer that we showed here. Those are all great, but they're basically just a continuation of. Um, they're like, they're like land cover maps out of time. Like there's no conception of consistency, stability, trend, harmonics. And that's my concern. If I look at, uh, like, I I can't use. I think I think the world cover product. Is, uh, sorry, the dynamic uh, world product is great, um, but it's it's quite difficult for me to use it in a lot of my work because I I just can't use it for like week to week. I can't do it with every sentinel two image. The land cover classification ping pongs all over the map. And I looked at it in um, Aleppo during the fall of Aleppo in late 2018. To say like, okay, most of the city was bombed. Just uh, a lot of the city was reduced to rubble in this period. How does it look in this dynamic world map? And um, wouldn't you guess it? But the whole city actually expands. The urban footprint expands during this whole period. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, and it, I think it's because, to your point, they aren't grappling with the the issues of temporality in remote sensing. That 
who is, I think the whole Jim Tucker at Goddard always said that there's much more information in the temporal domain than the spatial domain. And I think that is totally true. Like it's just going to be an arms race to get to the ever more minute pixel. And that's where a lot of the hype is. And that's understandable and fine. But all the information that we have about change that's not happening because we have one meter pixels. It's because we actually understand how to model change over time and how to grapple with uh, like asynchronous changes and what stability means and what disturbance means. That's where the real value is. And I don't think that those deep learning models, I'm not an expert in them um, and I'm certainly not involved in their production, um, but they don't haven't really seemed to grapple with that yet. And I'd be open if anyone else on the call knows more about this than I do. Um, but it, it seems like there's a lot of value if we could take some of the temporal considerations in, say, a CCDC model with some of the amazing deep learning applications that have gone into dynamic world and find a beautiful hybrid of the two where you can get, say, real time sub weekly land cover classifications at 10 meter yeah. resolution that take into account like harmonics and disturbance dynamics and conversion between land cover types and actually understand what that conversion looks like. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a, they're kind of, there's like, they're missing a process. It's just snapshot, 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 snapshot. Um, and then when you stack them all together, uh, they're out of sync with each other. So the process doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's the next stage. I, I can only imagine that's the next stage. And there's a lot of amazing people working on this. So I have no doubt we're gonna see awesome stuff, but it's so early days in this in this effort. Excellent. Okay, who sorry, what were you we gonna say? No, I was gonna I have a follow-up question, broader one, but I can wait some more to ask those. Well, let's see if does anyone else have a have the next question to ask? I'm going to pose one, Matt, before you go ahead, just to break up, break it up a little bit. So I have a totally non-technical question, but I'm curious. This effort um, is trying to build these databases, and I'm curious, what is the interaction between the kind of databases that you're building? And I don't know if there are others that are doing the same and the actual host countries where these refugee settlements are being built. I mean, it strikes me when I look at this that no government plans for, oh, we're going to have to build a refugee camp. It just, it happens to them and then they have to adjust very rapidly. Do they yeah. find, is the data that you're producing helpful to them in terms of figuring out how they're going to adapt? Or is it the case that you still have to have improved quality uh, of the data before it gets used? Like what, what is the user a database other than the, the people who are doing the research? Yeah, user. that's a great question. Um, there's a couple of ways to think about that. Um, the first is that UNHCR has no money and they need maps to show the severity of need and concern. Um, so we had a chart in IPCC in the last report that just showed um, it was the basically a heat stress chart that showed or map that showed number of days above a threshold of worrying heat stress for IDP camps and refugee camps around the world. Um, what we found out is that the UNHCR uses that in their funding calls now um, because they're, that, that captured sort of crystallized some of their concerns um, and it's a compelling, uh, though I had some cartographic concerns over the product, it, is, it does tell a concerning story that hasn't really been well fleshed out. Um, so there's sort of a, a, a value that we weren't expecting at all, actually, is like help the UNHCR make their case better to funders, which was kind of neat to hear about and, and very indirect. Um, as far as the uh, responding to the actual needs, um, there is a great uh, also, so part of this, like where this fits in is the kind of um, geospatial approaches that all of you would take on this call. Um, to undertake something like this and what we've done. This is not something that UNHCR can do in house. And when they go after, when they collect data, it ends up being very piecemeal. Uh, the population bureau collects one kind of data. The statistics bureau collects another kind of data. 
and then the uh, geospatial data, uh, the geospatial bureau collects a different kind of data set. Those groups don't talk to each other. So um, I can't right now point you to a database that both has latitude, longitude of camps and population. That sure. does not exist. Those have never been brought together. Um, and it's so piecemeal, and I, I, I would imagine also like opportunistic to collect these data in some cases. And I would imagine also to your point, right? Different countries have different concerns and needs about uh, some really are um, um, unwilling post posts. Some camp, some countries also host refugees, but are not uh, signatories to the convention. So those are really countries that are doing this out of like the really goodness out of of their own national heart, and it's expensive to do this. So. Um, and then you have other countries who are very antagonistic to refugees and make it very tough for refugees to, to be in that country. And there have been studies that show that um, those sort of the way refugees get treated actually influences how refugees decide which country they're going to go to. If they have a choice, they, these studies have shown that refugees are aware of treatment, uh, asylum seekers are aware of treatment and, and, and make decisions in part in light of that. Um, so some countries really just don't want this data out there. They don't. They don't want to collect it, um, and uh, they really just want to close down the refugee camp as soon as possible. Others um, are very open to hosting. Like Uganda, for example, has this seen as having a gold standard kind of refugee policy. They're very forthcoming with with hosting the data. Um, I think we haven't gotten to the stage yet of actually talking to host countries, but the way we're structuring our next study um, is very country oriented. So it's a global study and we're providing recommendations country by country, region by region, with the goal of trying to say like, I think there's a communication gap. We as geospatial scientists know what we can and can't do. and refugee camp management doesn't know necessarily what's possible with a lot of these products too. And so we're just trying to say like, look at the things we can do when we try to, to do it. Look at how we can organize this, how we can communicate this, how we can share these data. Um, look at these concerning things that we're finding. Look at these, um, oper the, these hopeful things that we're finding as well. Um, so I, I, I don't have a, a great answer other than to say that it's a super mixed bag and I expect there'll be some uptake and some countries will say, this is really helpful. Thank you. And some will say, why would you possibly, why, how could you possibly publish this sort of thing that says that we're at risk? You know, um, I, I don't really know how it's going to play out, but um, we're trying to be very direct with UNHCR and um, share preliminary findings with them so that we can kind of get feedback and temper the communication a little bit, develop something of a communication strategy. It's not in any way meant to be critical, but it is meant to be, you know, it's coming from a place of concern. Thanks very much. This is, um, it's obviously both very challenging, it's important, and it's rapidly changing. And I think you're right. I mean, it's, this is not going to go away. It's going to get worse. So the need for what you're yeah. talking, I think, is there. It's a question of how you make the connection. So thanks very much. Yeah. So we are at 1 o'clock. If anybody has a last question they'd like to ask, um, now would be the time. <laughs> and Matt, I think, did have another one he wanted to ask if nobody else wants to. I gladly yield my spot. I can always email Jamin later. Um, well, I'm not seeing anybody say they want to, so let's let's have it. So, Jamin, it's a rough time in the news right now, right? It's it's really a, a rough time for everyone for Team Humanity, um, and I think coming at your talk, you you take the approach that more knowledge is is better, that that knowledge can be used to help, and I think you've articulated a couple of examples like you can fundraise for UHR, but knowing what you do, and I admire that the absolute. HE double hop sticks out of what you do. How do you maintain hope and sort of feel like you're contributing directly and sort of keep going with when you're bearing witness to all this stuff happening, looking at conflicts from above? Um, yeah, I mean, the Gaza conflict is is very, very difficult. And people have been asking us about this um, lately. Um, I think like when I first started working on this, I was working on the drone campaign in Pakistan, which um, I honestly, in some ways, like, can't imagine a more brutal thing to study from space. It was just really, A, really challenging to study, and B, uh, it was so extreme. Um, it was very, very difficult to study that. 
Um, but since then, um, shifting more towards refugee camps, I think that that shift um, was helpful because there there is so much uh, there is so much hope. I mean, there is so much. It's just such a there's. It's really tough to I don't know. It's tough to say. I guess there's just so much humanity and um, innovation and enthusiasm and excitement. Um, that are that's expressed by refugee leadership by refugee children um there's a lot of really cool things coming out of refugee led ngos um that are just trying to kind of take leadership into their own hands so that's really inspiring and we're just trying to see you know we're not taking marching orders from from these groups but we're really trying to think about ways to complement and dovetail efforts as much as we can um so that we can just yeah like add to the add to the effort sort of help um amplify or or uh provide some new um uh, new insights at the stage we're at right now it's very like top down global systematic view um but i you know we have a, a nasa project where we're, we're working in ugandan food security with um catherine nakalembe and others and um that's just a that's I, I I have we haven't done field work yet, but I'm most excited for this project because I've just been looking at camps from space. That's all I've been able to do. We had field work planned for COVID and that got or during COVID and that got shut down. So I think you know working with people, working with with um, with families and households, that's really exciting. That's really motivating to me. It's just great to sort of connect with people. Um, the other work we're doing on armed conflict monitoring is a little more intense in other ways. Um, but even there, right, like we're, everything's abstracted. We're just looking at pixels. It's just mapping damage. It's not in any way at the same level of like, you know, the kind of images that are coming out of war zones. Like we're, we're not, we're not doing anything close to the sort of emotional level of that kind of effort or, or the, the personal risk. Um, we're, we're nothing compared to that. Um, but I think there are insights to be offered, uh, and it doesn't so much take, you know, uh, a lot of emotional reserve to do that. Um, it's just helpfully abstracted, I guess. We're very distant from it quite literally. So kind of helps keep going on it when we're not bogged down and, and actually, you know, we don't actually know all the things we're seeing. It's just abstracted. We just see these really strong signals. And so we say it could be one of these three things. Um, yeah, so I think that helps a little bit. Thanks. Oh, that was a hard question, man. I appreciate it. And well, thanks, thanks so much. The insight is really um, helpful. And the, to sort of the make connection between your, what you're doing and understanding what the human impact is, it's important work. So thank you for doing it. Well, thanks, everyone. I appreciate the interest and the invitation. It was really nice chatting with you all. OK, thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now. And then we will uh, post the recording once um, once it's posted. We'll send out a link to it. Thank Great. you.